Timing is excellent here. Rocco just made a delivery of spent brewery grain, which I'm a little embarrassed to say we're going to be composting. We actually aren't just composting it. Um, probably what, about 20% of it now we're treating with EM? Of the grain? Yeah. Uh, uh, 60 to 70%. Six, probably. Okay, 60, great, that's even better. We're treating with effective micro microbes. Um, this is Asheville, of course, is famous for its breweries, and we were very fortunate to, I was sitting at the computer when French Broad Brewery offered to let people come pick it up, and so we were able to get on the list and get it. We get about half to a ton, a ton a week of this grain, and what we do is we take, as much, and it's great because it comes hot, which is perfect for inoculating with effective microorganisms, um, which is a, a product you can buy, and in a, in a sense, we're ensiling it. We're kind of pickling it. It spoils in a day if you don't do that. But because we can ensile it, it's going to keep for weeks. And, of course, it's a now a, a probiotic. So we're using that for our chicken feed. We're utterly committed to no GMOs. This, I wish it was organic. It's not. It's pretty high in grain, you know, so hopefully it's not overly sprayed. If we could get organic, we would use it. But the big thing is we're never going to use GMOs. And yet we're cutting our feed costs by a whole lot. And we actually now are sharing it with two other farmers because to us it's a higher value that it be used as feed than for compost. But whatever is left gets composted. This, this is our um, compost system. And Juan's here. Juan can talk about composting <laughs> loudly. You know. Do you want to explain what you're doing here, Juan? This is Juan. Juan is one of our growers. And Juan does the composting. Uh, hi. Um, pretty much uh, these two piles, what I'm doing, like we had a low, like a late start. So we start with that kind of material, that's perfect example, that's what I use to start these beans. When I put that inside the bean, we add the grain, and the grain is to raise our temperatures. Right now it's at 120 degrees, I'm going to put that grain on this pile. I don't think, I think those two are hotter, but pretty much that's all manure that I didn't get time to compost soon enough, so I'm using that to get it hot enough so it breaks down really fast. But I use all the weed scraps that we have and a lot of stuff on, on the garden. And this is a forced air system, so we have a plenum underneath that the air comes through, and it's on a timer, and we want to adjust the timer according to how much oxygen the um, compost needs, um, and it runs. He turns it several times. It runs hot enough to easily meet process to further reduce pathogens. We're very fortunate. We get a manure that comes from a dairy that they use the corn stalks, the unchopped up corn stalks for bedding. Couldn't be a better product for making compost. Wonderfully bulky, so it breeds really well and heats up really well. Really excellent carbon nitrogen ratio. And we're getting some pretty spectacular compost. This one here is about how far along? It's about, that's almost done. Almost done, that's what I thought, yeah. Yeah, um, that's, it goes from what, if you look over there, and that actually a lot of the corn stalks have broken down just from sitting, but it goes from that incredibly bulky, rough stuff to this. And then what we've done, um, and we'll go up and take a look at it, is we've, last year, we bought, before we were making char, we bought in two yards of char, and we took compost tea, and it came in big bags. We took compost tea, and we basically just jammed it into each bag and blew it up a compost tea until it was ready to break. And then it had that on, laying on top of our compost, so the extra tea went down to the compost. And then we took that tea inoculated char to the compost facility that has a turner and had them turn that into the compost we made. And that's what we put in the greenhouse where we're now getting yields of like 20 pounds to a plant and have a, a CN. We also were fortunate to have some very high organic matter pond muck that we were able to put in those beds. We have a, I'm sorry, not a CN, but a cat cation exchange capacity. 21.5 in those beds. That basically is rivaling, ri or not, not rivaling, but approaching native prairie soils. You know, and that's not something that any farmer can do, but we're pretty convinced that you can get close to that with no-till methods and biochar, biochar and compost. Tomatoes, 
just in compost, or are you adding the compost to the native soil? No, we, we, we added it to the native soil. We actually kind of manufactured soil. The, where the greenhouse is, you'll see, is where they took away an entire bank and leveled the land. So we're in sub-subsoil there. I think the cation exchange capacity when we first started might have been three, you know. But we, we mixed that, 30%, this 8% organic matter pond muck, which made really nice soil. And then we added about two-thirds of a yard of 5% biochar inoculated in the, this kind of excellent compost. Two-thirds of a yard of that mix per 80-foot row. And that's what got us to that. You know, and it's, that is way more than you can do outside. But if you have, you'll see it's a very expensive compost facility. I mean, green, greenhouse facility. That's where you put that huge investment. You always put your best soil and your best resources into your most expensive space. And so that's what we did there. And we went from zero to 120 like that. You know, because we were able to use those resources and do that. So we've put our brewer in here, um, and this is a 110 gallon brewer. Uh, what I'll do with this brewer is I will fill it up uh, and set the thermostat to uh, 72 degrees, uh, allow it a couple of hours for the water temperature to come up to that. And we'll add approximately 25 to 30 pounds of our finished compost. Uh, a bag system similar to this. We also have a, a large sleeve system that we use. Um, there are two. There are two uh, aerators, giving us plenty of oxygen. Um, I'll add a few amendments, azomite, um, humates, a few, a few uh, uh, little parts foods of brew, and um, I'll allow that to brew approximately 16 to 18 hours. Um, and we'll check it mainly by smell um, and make the application at about 50-50, about 50% 50 water, 50% straight tea um, in that sprayer that you see there that's attached to that four-wheeler. Uh, and we'll try to keep our pressure below 200 PSI to keep from splattering our microbes on our plant surface. Um, and that's about it. It's kind of kind of difficult with the weather that we've been having, but we're, uh, we're doing the best we can. A key piece that I'm learning to my chagrin as I see other people teaching the compost tea stuff that I've taught them is, it's very hard for them to get that once you've brewed the tea, if you want to feed your plants, you have to add more nutrients. That the nutrients in the tea, in the compost that made the tea, have been eaten up by the microbes. You've been multiplying microbes on the nutrients that are in that compost. And so all the time I talk to people and they're telling me they don't get the results that I'm getting and stuff. And I get back to the fact that I told them they didn't get that once they make the tea, when they tank mix to spray, they add usually someplace, probably about 75% of label or two thirds of label. Yeah, somewhere around there. I mean, uh, fish emulsion. You know, if it's two tablespoons to a gallon, you'll add maybe a tablespoon and a quarter or something like that. You know, and any other foods you want to add, that's how you get the feed. You know, it's a common misconception that when you brew compost tea, you're magically brewing nutrients. No, you're brewing microbes. You need to apply the nutrients with those. And so that's, that's something that's real important for people to get. Um, we've had pretty amazing results from the tea. So this is the compost over here. Oh, by the way, the way you tell it's ready is it smells like the healthy side of a stream. You can see the difference here. You've got 5% char. Can't really tell it's in the compost. Really nice compost, and it's going to have an effect with 5% char. The thing about char is if you take a gram of char, and if you're able to measure the surface area in that gram of char, you would get the surface area of two tennis courts. And that's why it's such an amazing matrix for microbes, because it's all that, as Lang would say, all those condominiums for microbes. <laughs> you know? So here, we have 5%. Here, we have 50%. You know, 50% is what I see farmers working with. You know, I, the day, I'm looking, dreaming of the day that there's cost-effective heat-generating systems, energy, energy, energy generating systems that produce biochar, so farmers can make energy for their farm, have biochar as a byproduct, and then put that with good compost, let it sit, let let the life move in, and then put that out. And I think that that I think is a huge piece for carbon sequestration. It's not only carbon negative if you save the energy, 
it's dynamically carbon negative because this goes in and then life builds on it and life is carbon. So the potential is huge. Um, and I've lost sleep thinking about that one. Yeah. <laughs> Not worrying about it, being excited about it, you know. <laughs>